Everybody, <laughs> welcome to CR. It's worship time. Okay, take it away, Dave. Woohoo! Woo there we go. Thank you for that. All righty. Welcome, everybody. I have to take these off to see you, but I have to put the on to see this. So that's <laughs> okay. That's what happens when you get old. Anyway, um, hi, my name is Tammy. Glad you're all here tonight. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus. I struggle with codependency, people pleasing, and post abortion regret. And I'm glad to be here. Hey, so I'm glad you're here too. And the purpose of Celebrate Recovery is to allow us to become free from life's hurts, hang ups, and habits by working through the eight principles of recovery based on the Beatitudes we can and will change. We will begin to experience the true peace and serenity that we have been seeking. Through this program, we will restore and develop stronger relationships with others and most importantly with God. So if you're a newcomer tonight, yay, we love newcomers. We have a special class for you to kind of explain how our program works. And at the end of this large group time, you'll meet right over there. Um, this is the large group time. Uh, well, I'll do this other stuff first, the housekeeping stuff. So, uh, the bathrooms are down that hall with pictures on the doors. Um, it's a non-smoking campus, so if you really have to smoke, you can, there's a sidewalk out there, but it's really cold, so I would not do it if I were you. Uh, <laughs> um, please silence your cell phones if you haven't done that already. Um, we have a literature table over there with Paul, uh, and uh, our greeter is Tom tonight. Thank you, Tom, woohoo. Um, so there's literature over there. We sell it at our cost, and then some of it's even free. Yay, yay. Um, and then, um, well, let me just say, this is our large group time, so we start with worship, then we have large group, which is co-ed, and then we sp split up and go to our small groups, which is gender specific, and then we come back over here. So we have a special announcement girl, and she will be coming up to share the special announcements. Hello, Forever Family. How's everybody doing? All right. I'm a grateful believer, struggles with codependency and depression. My name is Freya. Glad to be with you all. So announcements, we have the men's group, Mike and Tim are facilitating, and they have already started. So, men, this is great. If you want to do a step study, you can join them. It is on Thursday nights from 6 to 8, and we do have a couple more of the books if you need the books um, to do the step study. Also, for women, come see either me or Tammy, and we are talking about starting a step study soon, Lord willing. So, come talk to us, and uh, that's all the announcements I got. Okay. Thank you, announcement girl. Yay. Um, so let's see. We need to read the steps and scriptures. And we have Brian, an uh, old familiar face, that's going to come up and help. Just you and me? Just us. Oh, I you hired somebody else. No, I didn't hire anybody else. I, Let I'm, me take I'm the tall the tight one. Then. You take the tall one, yeah. There you go. So I, I, once again, I already told you who I am, but. <laughs> I'm a born again, baptized follower of Jesus, a grateful recovering alcoholic, and my name's Brian. Woo hey Brian. Okay, so we're gonna read the steps and the scriptures for you. Step one, we admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors that our lives had become unmanageable. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what's good, but I cannot carry it out, Romans 7, 18. Step two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose, Philippians 2, 13. Step three, we made a decision to turn our life and our will over to the care of God. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship, Romans 12, 1. Step four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. 
Let us examine our ways and test them, and let us return to the Lord, Lamentations 340. Step five, we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Therefore, consist your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed, James 516. Step six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up, James 410. Step seven, we humbly asked him to remove all our shortcomings. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. Step eight, we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Do to others as you would have them do to you, Luke 6, 31. Step nine, we made direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Step 10, we continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Step 11, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, Colossians 3.16. Step 12, having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to others and practice these principles in all our affairs. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently, but watch yourself, or you may also be tempted. Galatians 6.1. Through, Through God's, God's grace, grace lasting, lasting change, change is possible. possible. Woohoo! Thanks, Brian. Right. Okay. Hi. Sorry, we start with pictures of my kids, and I always get so emotional. <laughs> um, my name is Kristen, and I am a very grateful child of God who is in recovery for codependency and abuse. Um, before we get started, I'd like to open with a brief prayer, please. God, we just thank you. We thank you for all that you've done, and we thank you for all that you will continue to do in our lives. I ask that my words tonight appropriately share the powerful healing that we can only find in you. Amen. Um, I was born October 12, 1983, in the small town of Pahokee. It's about two hours east of here on Lake Okeechobee. My mom was the bookkeeper for our family's farm, and my dad was a welder at the sugar mill. And we were, by all appearances, a happy family. In April 1989, my brother was born, and six weeks later, my dad left. He said he couldn't handle the pressure and that he just wasn't meant to be a father. I loved my dad so much, and I could not understand what was happening. As an adult, I know that my dad struggled with addiction and that he was diagnosed with both obsessive compulsive and bipolar disorders. So all of those hunting trips that he had taken when I was a kid that lasted exactly 90 days. Um, those were the times that he had admitted himself to rehab and he was trying to get help. After my dad left, my mom began dating a lot. And she met a man named Travis, and in 1993, they were married. I was 12 years old um, when Travis adopted my brother and me, and I was 14 years old the first time Travis molested me. Just after I turned 15, Travis decided to move my family from our small hometown where all of our friends and family were, and we went to um, rural Martin County. It's um, just south of the city of Okeechobee. We lived on two acres in the absolute middle of nowhere. It was a 30-minute drive to the nearest town or the nearest neighbor. Um, we were completely isolated. So around this time, 
He also added verbal, mental, and emotional abuse into the mix. And I received daily lectures on all of my choices, the food that I ate, the clothes that I wore, the friends that I had. Um, I was told that I wasn't smart enough, wasn't pretty enough, wasn't strong enough, and that I would never amount to anything in this life. And I believed every word that he told me. I felt this crushing weight of hatred toward Travis um, and loathing toward myself. See, my mom is blind, and at the time, my brother was only 11 years old. So I never spoke a word of the abuse to anyone. Um, if Travis left or if he was put in jail, what would happen to my mom? What would happen to our family living out in the middle of nowhere? So it was a lot easier for a 16-year-old kid like me to just um, live with a trauma rather than seeking help or seeking an escape. I was 17 years old the first time I drank, and I loved it because I was able to forget all of the things in my life that felt like they were slowly destroying me. It felt like the escape that I had been desperately seeking. After I graduated high school, I moved to West Palm Beach for college. It was the moment that I had been counting down to for years, and I was finally released from the toxic home that I grew up in. I was in a place where no one knew me, and I felt I could finally be free. Six weeks later, I went out with a group of friends from school, and Brian, the kid who was driving, he had the biggest crush on my roommate, and he had this brand new Camaro, and he really wanted to impress her, so we're at a red light, and he revs the engine, and as soon as the light turns green, he hits the gas, and we hydroplane into oncoming traffic, and we collide with a pickup truck. Um, it took three ambulances and a trauma hawk to transport everyone who was involved in the accident. So in that instant, all of this newfound freedom that I was so excited about, it was gone. I had to withdraw from school, and I returned home with a broken pelvis and a fractured tailbone. I spent eight weeks sober, in bed, unable to walk. After my injuries healed, I enrolled at the local community college, and I was determined to catch up on my lost semester. I was angry, I was depressed, and I was just in a hurry to find escape again. I was 18 years old the first time I tried cocaine, and just like alcohol, I loved it, because it was the perfect balance to my drinking. I could stay up all night, and I could manage my day just fine. And people who saw me, they thought I was doing so well after everything that I had been through with the car accident. I was taking seven classes. I was on the dean's list. I was working almost full time. Um, I had time to visit my grandmother and still go to church on Sunday. So what these people didn't know that I, I was really just a high functioning addict. I didn't just turn to alcohol and drugs to forget my home life, because um, that wouldn't have been enough. I also put myself in some very bad relationships. See, in my mind, I had equated sex with love. And that's dangerous enough, but my lack of sobriety, um, it just, it made me very vulnerable, and I was a very easy target. So in the 18 months that I was home following the accident, I was assaulted twice, and I was raped by my boyfriend and his best friend. Um, it was by the grace of God, and only by the grace of God, that I finished college, and I moved to Fort Myers in 2003. Two weeks later, God sent the man who would later become my husband. I was totally wasted in a parking lot, <laughs> but God was still working on me, even if I refused to work on myself. Evan and I were married November 19th, 2005. We honeymooned in Key West. I think I had fun, but I can't really remember. By that point, my drinking was totally out of control. Um, it wasn't just to drown out pain anymore, it was to drown out anything I didn't want to feel. So I drank to avoid boredom, um, feeling inadequate, feeling lost. I drank to drown out excitement that I couldn't handle. I drank at death, I drank at life, I drank at rejection and fear, I drank at happiness. I drank at anything that was um, mildly uncomfortable for me. It became what defines me, and any time I would start to see more of myself, more of my true self, the truth of my life at that time, I drowned it 
with alcohol so I could stay in what I thought was my happy, ignorant bubble. That way, I could appear fine on the outside. A year later, though, it all changed. I was driving home from happy hour, again, and、um, I had been listening to Way FM quite a bit at the time, and that's not something then I would have normally chosen, but again, God was working on me. And the program that was airing at the time, 2 a.m. on a Wednesday,、um, gave an invitation to give your life to Christ. So I pulled over right on top of the Midpoint Bridge and I cried out to God because I felt so tired. I was tired of who I had allowed myself to be. I was tired of the choices I had made. I was tired of how unwell my mind and my body felt. I was tired of living so recklessly. I realized that living a life that appears normal on the outside doesn't mean we're fine on the inside. And I admitted then that I was an addict. I had spent all my life searching for someone or something to take this pain away. I was so angry at the world for everything that had happened to me, for never having a father who loved me or cared for me or protected me. And in all that mess that I had made, I forgot that I, I do have a father. I had a heavenly father who loved me more than I could ever even imagine. And that was the beginning of me allowing God to work in my life. So the next month, my husband and I started attending Cape Coral First United Methodist. And we plugged in, we got involved, and I started my baby steps of walking the walk. In 2007, the church started a, a casual worship service with a praise band. And my husband runs the soundboard. And at the time, he mentioned to the worship arts director that I had played the bass in high school. And this was. True, I was in high school and I did briefly play the bass guitar,、um, but I had pawned it <laughs> when I was in the pit of my addiction. So, when the worship arts director invited me to rehearsal, I was nervous. I knew it definitely was not to hear me sing, because if you've ever heard me sing, you, you know what I'm talking about.、Um, you can imagine my surprise and my absolute terror when I found that they had all chipped in. And got me a bass guitar. I had not picked up a bass in years, but I started learning all over again. And it was very, very different this time, because this time I marveled at the way that we could truly, deeply worship through music. And it was something I'd never, never experienced before. And this became, pardon my pun, instrumental to my fate and to my recovery. When I used music for God's purpose, it was a feeling like nothing else. It was a feeling of rightness, of happiness, of, of wholeness. It was love. And I was finally understanding what could happen if we just let God direct our lives. In 2012, we found out we were pregnant with our first son. Miles was born in April 2013, and our younger son, Grant, was born May 2015. And these guys, oh man, they were not just my reason for getting up in the morning and all night long.、Um, they also became the catalyst for finally doing something and finding recovery. See, from the moment I became a mom, I felt this fierce instinct to protect my children because I knew I wanted our boys to have the things that I. Never did. They deserve parents who were present, who were loving, who were kind, who were respectful. I had held on to years of anger and resentment, and the weight of who I was, of the secrets that I had never shared, of the pain that I had carried for so long, it began to overwhelm me, and I knew I could not live this way any longer. So I started attending CR. On our church campus, and a dear friend began relentlessly encouraging me to attend the new members class. And I kept putting it off because I wasn't sure if I was ready to start unloading all of the baggage that I had spent so many years carefully packing away. I kept coming on Mondays for a large group until one Monday a testimony was given in which the speaker shared how important it is to pay attention to the people God puts in your path. And after months of debating, 
I finally stayed for the new members class. See, God had put my friend in my path over and over and over again. And she had faithfully followed his will, even though like, I did not give her a second glance. But after that message and hearing those words that I know God intended for me to hear, I stayed. I was finally paying attention. Now, I wasn't quite sure where I would fit in after the new members class. Um, like some of you, I'm sure I kind of qualified for every group. So um, realizing my greatest struggle was no longer chemical dependency, um, because by that time, I'd been drug-free for 12 years, and I had control of my drinking then. Um, I decided to, to join the women's codependency group because codependence will take anybody. So <laughs> but after that first meeting, I knew that I had found my people. Because they, they got me. They were the same as me. And even more than that, they loved me and they supported me without judgment. And that was like an absolute first for me. So a few months later, I signed up for the step study, and that was where the real work of my recovery began. Step one, we admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors, and that our lives had become unmanageable. See, I can follow the timeline of my life and my addictions, and where one addiction or compulsive behavior stops and another one begins, I see that beneath all of that lies my codependency. It's this compulsive need to control but an inability to do so. And that was my justification for every poor choice that I made. If I couldn't control the outside world, then I would control my inside world. But years of letting fear and anxiety control my life, of letting alcohol be a crutch, it had left me even more broken than I had been in the beginning. And I knew that I was powerless to save myself. Step two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. So my life before recovery was insanity, because living in chaos was how I coped. Drinking until I would black out, hoping that that would help me forget. Or going back to the same abusive partner over and over again, hoping that this time it was going to be different. Or defining myself based on what other people thought, hoping that if others liked me, I could learn to like myself. So over and over again, I put my hope in something besides Jesus. And over and over again, the result was exactly the same. I was still an addict. I was still a person who was full of hurt. I was still a person without hope because I was a person without Jesus. I came to recovery and I learned that God is the only higher power that restores me. Step three, we made a decision to turn our lives and our wills over to the care of God. See, I knew I couldn't do it on my own. I had tried to control things my whole life, and it had never turned out good. So following God's will for my life, turning it all over to him, that gave me peace within myself, peace I had never had before. And it gave me true hope, knowing that recovery is very real and very possible. See, God came in where my helplessness began because where we are weak, God is very, very strong. Step four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Just the words searching and fearless give me anxiety. But I knew the spiritual inventory was critical to my recovery, so I started writing resentments, hurts, fears, things I had spent years suppressing. I felt shame, anger, embarrassment, and sadness, recounting things that I had done in the past and things that had been done to me. But scripture tells us you can't heal a wound by saying it's not there. I worked through step four with the words, you have to feel it to heal it. The feelings were messy, very messy. But if I didn't empty myself of the mess, I would have no room for God's love and mercy and grace. You have to admit and work through those wounds to find healing. Step five, we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. So as I approached the fifth step, I realized the importance of having a sponsor and accountability partners. I had always been a person who chose to do things on my own building up a wall to protect myself or just pretending everything was fine, that had always been how I survived. 
But as I connected with folks through CR, and especially the women in my step study group, I came to realize not only the importance of having support, but the unconditional love and encouragement and peace that comes through having this family. Recovery is not a journey that we make alone. The load is easier to bear when it's carried by all of us. When I found my sponsor, I found a partner, a friend, a sister in Christ who has stayed right by my side every step of the way. She has been there to keep me accountable, on track, moving forward, even when my instincts, my character defects, keep telling me to isolate myself. Sitting down with my sponsor for my fifth step, reading through my spiritual inventory, it was a process. But it was also such a gift because I had finally emptied myself of the junk so that I could be filled with God's love. I know now that it wasn't isolation and separation that kept me going because I know now that my life before recovery wasn't really going. It was just me hiding in a bunker. Having the love and support of my sponsor, of someone who is Jesus in the flesh, that has kept me moving forward. Step six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Step seven, we humbly asked him to remove all our shortcomings. So by working through the steps, I learned so much about myself and my character defects, and I know where I fall short. And daily, I ask God to continue working to remove these shortcomings. I am not perfect, but God's love for me is, and he continues working in me. Step eight, we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Step nine, we made direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. So growing up in an abusive home and then finding myself in abusive relationships as a young adult. I had convinced myself that I didn't owe anyone anything. But here's what I've learned. I had to accept the things that I had done of my own free will. I had always told myself my addictions weren't my fault. They were the fault of the ones who hurt me, and I wouldn't even be using if they hadn't done what they did. But the reality is this. I'm the one who chose to drink. I'm the one who chose to use drugs. That's how I decided to deal with what had happened to me. Today, I know I don't have responsibility for my abuser's actions or their choices, but I do have responsibility for my own. Once I accepted that, it was easier for me to see the ways in which I had hurt others and to find the humility to make amends. Step 10, we continued to take a personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. So every day I ask myself to choose words and actions that are helpful, not hurtful. And it doesn't always work out that way. But now I can recognize when I have hurt others and because I want everyone to experience the awesome love that God has for us, I can make amends. Step 11, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Step 12, having had a spiritual experience as the result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others and to practice these principles in all our affairs. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us when someone becomes a Christian, he becomes a brand new person inside. He is not the same anymore. A new life has begun. We, we are brand new. We are not the same anymore. All those years, I didn't even know it, but God was working for me, working on me, working to save me. God loves us, and he relentlessly pursues us. He loves us so much, he sent his son to die for us, to free us, to give us brand new life. The price of our sin was paid in full by Jesus on the cross. And the moment that I truly, deeply realized the power of God's love, of what he is willing to do for us, that was the spiritual experience. So what do I do in my brand new life? I celebrate. Today, I have victory over drugs and alcohol. In November, my husband and I celebrated our 15th anniversary. Thank you. <laughs> and God bless him for everything he's had to put up with over the years. Um, I celebrate my sons, who are now almost eight and six, 
They gave me the desire to pursue God and to live differently. I celebrate the friends I've made through CR who are more than just friends. They are my family, my forever family. In my brand new life, I have healing. I have forgiven my abusers because I realize they are also people in need of healing, and I pray that they find recovery. I'm not resentful of my real dad. I understand and I respect his choice to leave, knowing it was best for both his healing and for our safety. And today I can celebrate that he has 20 years of sobriety. In my brand new life, I also do whatever God directs. I mean, I was blessed with the opportunity to come here and share my testimony, which isn't really my testimony at all. It's God's. It's the story of what He has done for me. In December, we started our Women's Abuse Recovery Open Share group, and I have the humble honor of co-leading this group with the woman whose testimony I heard on my very first night at CR. See, God has a way of bringing things full circle. I have the joyful privilege of playing bass with our worship team on Monday nights, and I continue to find that awesome healing power of worship through music. And next month, I'm going to join some amazing folks in leading our step study. When we fully embrace our new life in Christ, He will use us in amazing and unexpected ways. So to the newcomer, we love you. We can't do this without you. You are the reason we are here, and you can do this. Romans 8.31, my life verse, says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us? No one. There is no one who can keep you from experiencing the life that God has planned for you. It's a big step. It's a scary step. But you can do this. I know because I remember what that first night felt like. But I also know what tonight feels like. Romans 5, 1 through 5 tells us, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. Endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment for we know how dearly God loves us. He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. God loves us. God loves you. God will never, never leave you. God loved us before he knew us, and God loved us before we knew him. God loved us when we turned away, and God loved us when we could not love ourselves. God loves us just as we are today, and God loves us for who he knows we can be tomorrow. God will use every single part of you for good. Your scars are evidence of his healing. Your cracks are where his light shines through. Our greatest weaknesses become our greatest strength to share the story of what God can do. My prayer tonight is that you will open your heart and let God show you just how much he loves you and just how much he can do. Thank you. What, what, what? Oh! Mike, Mike, Mike. Mike's phone. Sorry. I was just, yeah. Um, uh, and just a reminder if you're a newcomer, you're going to meet right over there by the table and be, be with the newcomers group leaders tonight. So um, the Serenity Prayer is going to be up there on the screen in a second. Um, so we'll have just a moment of silence followed by the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, 
enjoying one moment at a time accepting hardship as a pathway to peace taking as jesus did the sinful world as it is not as i would have it trusting that you will make all things right if i surrender to your will so that i may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever and the next amen, amen. thank you mike for a good lesson on on sanity <laughs> serenity serenity comes with sanity by the way and uh we'll meet back here at eight o'clock so you're we are adjourned to your small groups yes <laughs>